my name is Stuart Waiton. I am an academic and I am the chair of the Scottish Union for Education. Um, just, again, I'm assuming people might know what that is. In case you don't, it were, it's a union that's been set up for and by uh, academics, parents uh, and teachers. Um, and what we're trying to do is to question uh, a variety of things that are taking place within education and concerns that are being raised uh, about education online and uh, in various forms, which is why we've got Nancy here, because of what's happening in America. So concerns that um, have been expressed, for example, around the sex education curriculum, the issue of uh, gender fluidity, which is uh, a particular concern of mine, um, increasingly in fact, uh, and uh, I've often been concerned, as other people have again in America as well, about what appears to be an obsession with racism and a quite divisive and dogmatic discussion about white privilege, which seems to be more divisive than helpful. Um, but we're also concerned about the nature of education, which is something else we hope to try and address. So it's not just about these issues, but it's the fact that it appears that education as a thing in itself is actually declining and becoming less useful. Uh, and in Scotland, you can see this in terms of even the, the standing of uh, Scottish education seems to be declining. So part of the, the issue and concern is that a lot of these other subjects that we're talking about seem to be uh, bogged down schools. They're actually getting in the way of teaching subjects and developing and inspiring children. Um, and that's a concern we have, as well as the this issue of, is there a form of indoctrination, indoctrination and uh, politicisation taking place? So we hope to become a force in Scotland with uh, your support. We hope to become a union um, that is supported by parents, teachers and uh, members of the community. Um, if you don't know, we have a sub stack. Um, uh, the address for which is uh, you just you can type sub stack in Scottish Union and it comes up or it's Scottish Union for Education dot sub stack dot com. And that's partly you can read that for free or you can subscribe and that's one of the way we're trying to get people to actually join the union and fund the various uh, campaigns that we're going to be involved with. And also, if you want to get in touch with us, we have an email, which is info at scottishunionforeducation.co.uk. Um, and that's another way that you can just contact us and uh, uh, let us know what issues there are in your school, in your area or uh, in general. Uh, just so you know, our next, so this is our first online event, our next online event is uh, on the 30th of March and we have Lionel Shriver who is the acclaimed American novelist um, who I think lives in Britain uh, at the minute as far as I know uh, to give her take on some of the themes and issues that we're trying to look at. Right I'm recording the event and I thought because I want this to go on the substack uh, and I thought the best way to do this would be to record the discussion between myself and Nancy, just uh, record part of the conversation, because I really want this to be a chat amongst the people who are here. Um, and so I want to record possibly about half an hour of the, uh, the conversation. And then I'm going to stop recording in case there are people here who want to say something without it being recorded. Because uh, as I say, this is really, as much as anything, it's it's a, it's to have a meeting between relatively like-minded people, I suspect, some of whom are uncomfortable about what's happening uh, and don't necessarily want to sort of um, uh, stick, stick their face into the public realm about some of their concerns. So at a certain point, I'll stop recording, but we'll continue the conversation. Um, uh, for another half hour or so, depending on uh, what people want to do. Okay, uh, I think that's everything. So, this is uh, over to Nancy. Um, I thought, to start with Nancy, 
you might tell us a bit about yourself. So this is this is up to you how much you want to expose. <laughs> you live in a we well, live in an expose society, if there is such a word. Um, so maybe you can tell us about who you are now or who you were as a child. Um, over to you. Okay. Well, um, I guess the most important uh, thing about my formative years um, is that uh, my family moved around a lot. So um, by the time I was 18, I'd lived in 13 different places um, and I had gone to nearly that many schools. Um, <clears throat> and so what that meant was that I was constantly having to um, uh, make friends with new people, meet new people. I was constantly being kind of you know, dropped into new situations. Like, for example, we moved to Texas when I was about seven and I came from up north and everybody was saying, y'all. And and I can remember, you know, like sitting in front of a mirror, practicing saying, y'all, y'all, until I could get to the point where where I could say it. Um, and and I guess part of and 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 part of that experience um, really led me to be fascinated by families because, um, uh, you know, when you move around that much, you meet lots of different kinds of people, lots of different kinds of families. And uh, so I was, I was always I was always fascinated by that. Um, and then later on, um, when I was in New York, um, after having lived in the UK, so I know I know a bit about um, the the uh, the situation uh, there. Um, I am um, when I had kids of my own, um, I ended up uh, running a large parents list listserv with some other people, uh, which is called Park Slip Parents, which kind of happened at a time when um, parenting was really crazy, and if parenting was crazy in America. Uh, it was probably the most crazy in New York and California. And so I was kind of in the middle of that. And um, after, you know, kind of uh, uh, having this front row seat, I decided to write a book about it. Um, and so that has kind of um, done all the things that that you would expect something like that would do is, you know, I know a lot about the subject now. I'm very concerned about what's happening with our kids. I'm very sympathetic to parents. Um, and and then everything in the States happened. Um, so so I don't know. Does that help? <laughs> yeah, it does. So you're in you're in New York at the minute. Yes, I am in upstate New York. Um, upstate New York, right. OK, so how far from Manhattan, a few hundred miles? Uh, about, uh, we're about, uh, seven hours drive. Yeah. So, I mean, technically if you drove and you wore nappies, you could get there in four hours, but, um, you know, if you, you know, we're, we're very fast, but it takes us about seven hours with traffic and everything and stops. Okay. So the, the parenting thing I thought before we get onto the discussion about schools, cause there's a lot happened in America with schools parents conflicts between the two which is i suppose where i imagine at least part of the conversation is going to go here um as you, you said you you wrote a, a, a book about parenting um and it's it, it wasn't necessarily my uh, purpose to get into this area but because of things that have happened in scotland so i i, I imagine you might know about the named person scheme Scotland, which I'm imagining people here will know about. But one of the things that I, I thought was fascinating about it was the extent to which the Scottish government felt that it was entirely legitimate to create a named person for every child, which to people who are a little bit critical of the government almost spontaneously felt was a huge impingement, you know, a real... Um, intrusion into the family where the, suddenly the state is defining well-being frameworks for 
raising children. Uh, and so I, one of the things I'm interested in, which I thought I'd ask you about, is how what what the relationship is between the idea of parenting and parenting experts and what your experience has been about the, of that in America. Right. Well, um, what I discovered when I went back and I was looking at the development of, uh, of, of child rearing um, since the 70s, <clears throat> what I discovered um, is that in the 70s, there's this complete break with the past way that we were raising kids in a way. And the reason why that happens is that um, is that families become too unstable to service like kind of kind of the the way that we raise children um and that was because of a sort of a, a a cultural turn but also the increase in divorce so you have this really intense period in the 70s where half of all marriages broke up uh, and so half of all families um broke up and what that meant was that parents found themselves in this position where um it, it wasn't like anything that had happened before. Um, they really didn't know what they were doing. And so they turned to experts. And it's it's largely forgotten now here, but there were experts who had phone and radio shows. There were television series. I mean, it was like uh, it was like a, a, a really um, a kind of uh, crazy period. Where you had uh, you had uh, uh, just hundreds of people giving parenting advice. There were parenting classes that people, you know, uh, now usually you only take them when you've committed a crime, but uh, but back then, you know, people would go along to them willingly. And what happened over a couple of generations is that well, two things happened. One is that parents began to kind of internalize a lot of the contradictory advice that they were receiving from experts, um, which uh, then made them very kind of self-conscious. So they, they were second guessing themselves all the time. But the other thing that it did was it really eroded parental authority uh, just across society. And so we have a situation today where um, you could have something uh, mooted like the named person scheme because parents, well, what do they know? You know, they they um, they they they've just they're just they just have these children. They're not psychologists. They're not nutritionists. You know, they're not doctors. They don't have any of the expertise um, that are supposedly necessary to to raise children. Um, yeah. Okay, well, I'm I'm raising that in part. I'm getting you to raise it so that people can ask about this because I, I do think it's an aspect. W I become obsessed with the politicians and the education authorities, um, but of course, part of the question in all of this is parents and parental authority, um, which we, we tend to ignore to some extent because we can everything appears to be coming from the state and from politicians, but there is still a question about uh, parents. Um, OK, this is a, a, a curious question. But I, was, I was just looking at articles that you'd written. And you wrote an article about the one. It's a Wonderful Life, the film. Um, and the reason that I thought this was interesting, um, if, if someone's got their mic on, by the way, because this little doop, doop, doop keep happening, so people can turn their mics off. Um, anyway, uh, the the article I just wrote for the Substack raised this issue of uh, common sense and whether there is such a thing as common sense today. And I would say there's there's two dimensions to this. One is that at a certain level there does appear to be a common sense. So you come across parents who look at the material that's been introduced in the sex education classes. And they think it just doesn't make sense for children to have this. So there does seem to be at a certain level a common sense, right? And, and there's, I think there's still a common sense on things like um, um, gender fluidity, right? To an extent, although I, I just watched uh, Matt, whatever his name is, his program, What is a Woman? And he was walking around America uh, and asking loads of people in the street, is it all right if I say I'm a woman? 
and almost everyone was saying, yeah, yeah, be who you want to be, man. Uh, so, although he may have edited everyone else out, but I still like to think there is a common sense that people realise there is a man and there is a woman to an extent. So I think there is a common sense, but at another level, I don't think there is. And I don't, I don't think we feel confident as individuals that what we what we believe is what everyone else believes and which brings me back to it's a wonderful life because the point you're making about a wonderful life is why we like this is because there does seem to be a sense of commonality there and there seems to be something important in that film that perhaps we've lost something not to overly romanticize and it is just a film but i partly raise it because apparently you live in the place where a wonderful life was based, which I also thought was I do. <laughs> fun, fun. I, fun. Anyway, I live uh, 15 minutes from uh, from Seneca Falls, which was the basis for the uh, Bedford Falls of the movie, even to the point where you know it's now we watch it every Christmas, and it's like, oh, it's Genesee Street, and you can kind of you know pick out the places, um, and that's because uh, Frank Capra. Um, had an aunt who lives uh, who lives in uh, or who lived in a place called Auburn, uh, which is very close. It's on the other side of Seneca Falls, um, and he uh, came here because, I mean, the the original story for It's a Wonderful Life um, is actually very different than the film, and so a lot of this is his creation. And so he came up to. Um, to Seneca Falls and spent a lot of time and, you know, made sketches. And, um, and so that's why um, the place looks so much like, um, like the film. Um, but, you know, it's interesting because um, he, Capra made that film at a time when he had come back from the Second World War and he'd been a really famous filmmaker before he went. He went to the war, he came back and he said, people are saying, Frank who? Um, and so, uh, you know, and he, and he lost his place in the studio system. And so he and some other filmmakers uh, set up um, a company called Liberty Films. And this was actually, it turned out to be the one film that Liberty Films made. But what he was responding to um, was actually a terrible demoralizing experience of the Second World War. Um, because he and the people who uh, were involved in the war um, really witnessed just the worst of what people could be. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, in fact, you know, one of his fellow filmmakers was one of the first people to um, be there when they liberated the camps. And it, so it was just this, this um, really existential, existentially shaking experience. And so what he wanted to do um, was he wanted to reassert what is good about people um, because, he, you know, he came back and it would have been very easy to become cynical. And, you know, and a lot of people did because, you know, you came back, you'd seen all of these amazing, terrible things, and then you're supposed to get on with normal life. And that just, you know, felt very hollow for people. But what, so if you watch what he does in It's a Wonderful Life, he really kind of takes all of the things that at the time people are sneering about, like duty, um, like, you know, putting aside, you know, what you want to do. So George wants to go off and build buildings, but he ends up staying and taking care of the, the savings and loan. You know, he he. he he uh, marries. He has lots of kids. The finial on the on the the staircase falls off every time he tries to go upstairs, and it's just frustrating. And just when he thinks that things are gonna things are are starting to look up, there's a huge reversal. And so what Capra does in a really wonderful way is he takes all of the things that people are frustrated with. And he's able to kind of turn that on its head and to show that actually that sort of that sort of selflessness, that commitment, that being part of something bigger than yourself is a is a wonderful thing. 
and something that we don't appreciate. And, I, and I'll start crying if I think about it too much more. But it's a but it's a fantastic film, and you know, I, I um, every time I every time I see it, you know, as I go through my life, I find something new to appreciate about it. And and here I am, and I can visit the museum and <laughs> and stand on the bridge <laughs> and all that. So. Yeah, it's, it's funny when you said that because when when I was reading the article, I thought if Nancy starts talking about this too much, it might, it might bring a tear to my eye. But <laughs> I, I weep at almost anything, so uh, there will be nothing too novel about that. Um, okay, so on to parents versus education authorities. So I was I was looking briefly at what's been happening in America, which seems to be a lot. But I mean, America is a big place, so. You know the, the extent to which that's true, I, I don't know. But we've got Parents Unite in New England, who appear to be influenced by lockdown because they started to see what their kids were getting um, uh, in, in terms of Black Lives Matter influence. That seemed to spiral into not just Black Lives Matter stuff, but the gender uh, issues and um, other things. You've got um, Ron DeSantis, American governor of Florida, who's had a run in with Disney. Um, and he was involved in some kind of stop wokeness uh, education. Um, Republican Glenn Youngkin, who won uh, an election in Virginia, uh, Virginia Democratic. A democratic state apparently I always thought Virginia because it was in the south it must be Republican but you know that's my my ignorance more than anything I suspect so there's all sorts of things you can't touch on everything obviously because there's a million things but I just thought because what what we're trying to do I suppose is to some extent replicate uh, and build on what other people are doing in Wales and around the world I just thought perhaps you could tell us a little bit about what you think is happening in America? <laughs> not not the whole of America, perhaps, but a bit. Well, uh, I mean, I think I think it's interesting because uh, I think the schools are almost like a window onto a fundamental problem that we are uh, that we are uh, uh, confronting as a nation, um, and. Uh, that is that our bureaucracy um, has been uh, pretty much uh, captured um, by. Um, I mean, I hate to use a but buzzwords, but 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 there is a sort of different way of looking at the world, um, which is very much based on identity. It's very much based on um, kind of postmodern things about, you know, uh, the dynamics of power and standpoint theory and, and all of this. Um, and, and, and this is somehow a kind of migrated over the last uh, 10 to 20 years from uh, academic settings where, you know, people knew it was going on. And it's now, uh, it's now within the government itself it's also within um, NGOs and nonprofits, and it's most worryingly it's in it's it's in schools um, where these ideas have been um, uh, propagated by uh, teachers who have you know come out of academia. They've deeply imbibed uh, these ideas, and uh, they are they really believe that they're doing a good thing in teaching kids about the way the world really works. Um, and, and um, you know, it's, 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 uh, it, it's, a, it's a terrible problem, but it is interesting because um, one of the things I was thinking about is that in the United States over, I, I would say over a long period, you know, maybe from the sixties onward, there's been this disengagement from politics by ordinary people. And it's like, you know, there's a lot of cynicism about politicians. Um, you know, it, it, the kind of criteria was, well, are they competent? Um, but, you know, as long as they weren't like messing things up badly, people would just kind of, you know, go, go along with them. Um, but what's happened now is that 
it's become very difficult to have a say in um, uh, in ruling our country, except for the vote every few years, and 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 really just the presidential vote because nobody takes the local um, the local elections very seriously. But it's interesting because the school board is one of the few public forums left for people. And I think it's so interesting because, um, you know, uh, it's be, that has become kind of the, the focal point for not just um, a concern about what is happening with schools and with children, but it's also one of the few places where people can actually, you know, s uh, stand up and have a say um, because everything else is just so, so sewn up. Yeah. Um, just final question before I bring everyone else in. So if, if everyone else wants to think about questions they've got, but also just points you want to make. Um, so on the one hand, it would appear that what we're trying to do here with the um, Scottish Union for Education is to influence education. But on the other hand, uh, you could say that, well, it's not really parents' role to influence education. Right? There's a, so if you if you see what I mean, it's like, you, it's but not it really. Absolutely our role to influence education. <laughs> well, what's, what's the balance then? That's a, that's a question then. So what's the balance? Because, um, you know, I wouldn't expect myself or even the Scottish Union for Education to be able to say this should be the books you read in English. This should be what you study in history. This should be such and such. But nevertheless, I do think that we would want to challenge some aspects of how the, the curriculum are being turned from educational into indoctrination and, and political. Right. But I mean, how do you see that balance in terms of parents' right to have a say? You know, the role of education is something that's separate. Well. I mean, you know, from the from my position in the states, um, I, I mean, it's interesting because I, the historically, what would happen is that people would settle in a new place, and then all of the adults would get together and they would set up a school, um, and um, and you know, there were certain things that certain materials that people would have, like there were readers and various materials but there was there was an understanding that this was our responsibility um as you know as the adults and so you know what what would happen is that you know you would you would hire a schoolmaster or you would uh, hire a school mistress and there was kind of a consensus on what you wanted to promote and what you wanted to learn and i think um so i i i think that that parents have um, certainly have an interest in the education of, of children, and we have a responsibility. Um, but I think that what's happened is that this, there's this there's now this gap has arisen between the experts on the one hand um, who um, are uh, are have a, adopted a very different set of values or or beliefs. Um, uh, on the one hand, and they're setting up the curriculum, and they're and they're increasingly, you know, shaping young teachers to teach that way, where it's not about what we understand as education. Um, it's about it's about um, it, it's really about social engineering. Um, and but, I mean, but, but <laughs> then having said that, it's been so long since parents have had that direct role in education that I think there's really a sense that, that people don't appreciate what education is for. And in some ways, you know, it would be very useful just to go back and to, and to talk about well, what is the purpose of education and how is that different from what is happening in our schools right now? Yeah, good. OK, that's very useful. Right. And uh, someone still, still got their mute off because I can hear you typing. So whoever's typing <laughs> loudly, if you can put your mute on. Um, right. OK, I'm going to now just everyone's going to become a little face. 
if I can make this work. Uh, and we're just going to open it up to a conversation. OK, OK, so if people want to put their cameras on, that's good because then we can see everybody and it's kind of nice if they want to. Um, if you want to ask a question, you can raise the little hand at the top where you can see a little hand with the raise. And if you click on that, a little yellow hand appears. Uh, oh, there you go. I have Claire already followed by Amanda. I might take a few because this is just hopefully just going to be now a chat and we and perhaps um, if you can be bothered, if you want to say who you are, where you are, if you're a parent, a teacher, a grandparent and what, why you're here, I suppose, what's concerning you. You don't have to do that if you just want to ask a question, but if you want to do that, I'd be interested to know. Claire. Hi there. Um, I'm sorry I was a little bit late. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Oh, OK. Right. Brilliant. Um, well, I just uh, I just woke up about a month and a half ago. And um, when I say woke up, I attended a rally in Glasgow, George Square, um, led by Kelly J. Keane. She's a feminist. And it's all about the men and women's um, spaces and prisons and things like this. And it came up with trans teachings in schools. Um, I've went completely mad and started a complaints procedure against my local primary school and the acting head teacher. And I've been in touch with the Scottish Union for Education and you guys have been so kindly asking me to keep you updated on my progress with it all. Um, now, this, the, you guys know about the complaints. I'm trying to, sorry, I'm, I'm a bit of a dinosaur on social media. This is completely alien to me, what I'm doing, sorry. Um, I've, I've got the three complaints that I actually put in against the school um, and I'm just going to read them out to you. Um, now, I was in a meeting with the acting head teacher um, about the trans teachings and within five minutes I had to establish whether or not I was in the room with a sensible person. So I asked her whether or not she was a woman. She replied yes and then I asked her if she had a vagina to which she replied yes. As the meeting went on, I got to about seven minutes into it and realized that perhaps I was not in the room with a sensible person because I then had to reconfirm what she'd told me. So I just had to confirm with her. I said, Mandy, can we just confirm at this point that you would agree with me that a biological woman has a vagina? And her reply to me was, well, I don't really know. Um, now, that to me sent terror through me that the acting head teacher does not know what constitutes as a biological woman. So what I've done is I've, I've started a complaints procedure with my local school. Hello, son. Hello. I've started a complaints procedure with my local school. That's my youngest one, sorry. Um, and I'm going to read out three complaints if you'll allow me to do that. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay, right, so the first complaint is the failure of acting head teacher at Menstrie Primary School to have any knowledge of what constitutes a biological woman. The second complaint is Menstrie Primary School promoting the, the systematic sexual abuse of children and young people through the delivery of the relationship, sexual health and parenthood curriculum and through their culture and ethos by delivering non-factual information that children and young people can biologically change their sex. And the third complaint is menstrual primary failing to safeguard children and young people by indoctrinating them to believe that if they are confused about their sexuality, that they can change sex and mutilate their bodies and take puberty blockers. Um, now, I'm now starting to get ignored in my village. I have women who hang their heads in the street when they see me coming. Um, now, the whole place is either run by fucking paedophiles here because I'm pulling my hair out. Sorry, I don't speak very good French, especially when it comes to this topic. And I've wrote to my four local councillors. Um, I've working with Clipman and Share Council because the complaint has been escalated to a stage two because I will not shut up and I need help. And I'm on here because... I'm a parent of a, an 11-year-old girl 
And I do not want this escalating to her going to high school and being met when she has to attend to her personal feminine hygiene needs in a toilet to be met with a cock and a frock claiming that he's a girl. When in actual fact, maybe, because we have to bear in mind here that predators, sexual predators and perverts when they're adults, they have to stem from somewhere being children. So we know they're amongst us. And I don't really want my girls, my daughter's personal space or mine to be to be that, you know, that honest. I don't want that to be taken away. So I've started that complaints procedure against my school. And I would absolutely bloody love it if I could get two or three hundred people outside the school gates because the, the, the whole village is sleeping. They're sleeping and they, they don't realise what's going on here. I found a book the other day, My First Pride. And on the front of the book, it was the most sinister looking cartoon I've ever seen in my life with the paedophile information alliance sign on the front of the cover. And we've got to do something here. And yeah. that's why I ran over. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying, that's, I'm really that's, trying. That's, that's, Thank, thank um, you for that rant. I'll just go. want to say, Nancy, really brilliant to hear from you as well. That was lovely. It's lovely to hear from you, Nancy. Great. Thank you. Right. Over to Amanda. Oh, that's me. Hi. Well, Claire, I think you've just established us as a charter there. Um, <laughs> a charter for action. Uh, yeah. You're not alone. You're really not alone. I'm a teacher um, in, I happen to work in an American school in France, a private school, and I've had uh, issues as well um, with regards to gender and, and things like that. You know, the sort of them, their thing where a student wanted to be called they or whatever they, it was, and I refused. So now the problem i find which is probably what you're finding as well claire is that um many people in my uh, in the faculty where i work they they're not seeing this as a problem they thought i was just being fussy you know they thought i was just being you know taking it too far and sort of uh you know making making a fuss about nothing uh, so that's one of my problems, part of the problem. I got a lot of help from Nancy, um, who helped me hugely throughout this process. And I'll tell you something, you do feel lonely and you do feel slightly scared. I don't care. Um, I, yeah, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Go on, Amanda. Oh no. I think she's crashed. Right, we'll we'll come back to Amanda. We can't hear you at the minute. Um we'll go to Kate. If, if you want to mute yourself, Claire, just in case there's any any links. Um, hi everybody. Uh my name's Kate. I'm from Pennsylvania, actually. So I have the American side of things, but I've been in Glasgow for 23 years. Um, I'm a long time advocate for children. I, I um, grew up in a, an area of Philadelphia that was plagued by violence. Um, my parents moved to the suburbs when I was in primary school. And um, I was very lucky to have a good education. Um, and subsequently have done a lot of work with children. Some of you may be familiar with my activism as the dancing Christmas tree. I raised 18,000 pounds for schools in the past three years. Um, and uh, and I'm very vested in children's well-being as well as having a 10 year old son. Something that's been really worrying to me about to me in particular is the fact that we are at the mercy of the educational system I, mean, I have so many problems with the education system but i think the core thing is that we are in a targeted area for the strikes at the minute um and what i'm finding like talking to my family in the states is that there's no other options for us it's like what do you do it, the system is rigged. Like I'm not happy with the state of, of education. I'm not happy with the move 
from, from a, a, a system of education that comes from Piaget, that's based around child development, and it's based about, around opening children up based around child stages to this activist education, or as I call it, disaster education, where, where children are, are made into global citizens. Um, I also have a complaints procedure against my school at the minute. Um, my head is not working because I've been not because of these strikes, like I've not been able to do anything about that. But I suppose where I'm coming, just to give you that some context, something that I'm very aware of, like you were talking about the the um, the school boards having power, like that's something I'm watching with great interest from this side. And I don't feel here in Scotland we have the same power. Like I tried through the parent council to get garner some more awareness to address problems within our school and I got my wrist slapped by the school and saying no you are not allowed to do that right and so we are empowered as parents unlike in the states I mean the states is the best and the worst of everything right but but the thing is in the states you do have the power you see school boards flipping across the United States that's something I've been watching with great interest we're here I'm like what is my choice my parents are like change schools and I'm like where do I send my child because it's either you go to the state system and they're all the same indoctrination across the whole thing it's all this Palo Freire indoctrination activist nonsense the Foucault postmodern all this stuff that does not belong in schools um, or you can homeschool and like I'm a single parent I can't do that so like what like I'm so glad that you exist Scottish Union um, for education but I'm like but at the same time like I, I feel really disempowered at the minute because like I don't know what to do with my child like I'm so scared for him I'm so scared for him I'm so scared for the children in my community I'm like hearing your story about your child like that and your head teacher saying that is like it blows my mind but then what do you do you go to the next school maybe you'll get lucky and that head teacher will be sensible maybe not but where is our power like you were saying like the whole thing about parental parents having some sort of power so this is like my big thing great that's really useful um i'm glad you're a fundraiser because it links <laughs> Because I'm trying to get, I don't know if you can see Jenny on your screen, but we have a doctor here, uh, ex-pediatrician, and I'm trying to get her to write um, a pamphlet uh, on the transgender policy in Scottish schools, which we will print uh, and send to every head teacher in Scotland and make a bit of a fanfare about this to try and challenge it. I'm also, although... I, I suspect this is not doable, but I'm also curious about the use of law in terms of what we can do around challenging some of this, because um, it goes against the values of parents and in Scottish law. In theory, we shouldn't be teaching anything that is, is, is clearly clashing with uh, parents' values. So we're very keen to try and run with this. So we're, we're going to try and raise £7,000. So as you've raised £18,000 for Christmas trees, <laughs> that should be no bother for you whatsoever. Anyway, I think... <laughs> I'll get it tomorrow. Tomorrow, that's good. I think Amanda is back. So sorry, if you can mute yourself for a minute, Kate, thanks. And uh, Amanda is back. You disappeared, but you're back, Amanda. We did, yeah. Had a power cut. Oh, got, can I just uh, ask you, are, are you still in France or are you in... Yes, I, yes, I live in France, yes. Yeah. Right. Okay. yeah, yeah, and I teach in an American school in Grenoble. So, you know, it's a small school, but uh, yeah. So, yeah, no, but basically my question was pretty similar to what other people are saying here. I was I was saying that with, my, with the faculty... Uh, they weren't seeing this as a problem, you know, they just thought, oh, you know, she's going off on a bender and all this. So basically, how do we counter this without looking like rabid dogs, if you see what I mean? Because that's how they're going to portray, portray us. And they portrayed other people, you know, the bloke in America who fought against... Um, who was who, the parent who was um, whose daughter was raped by a young lad in a in a skirt, um, you know, treating this parent as an absolute rabid, um, 
monster. Um, so I just want, it's the same kind of question along the same kind of theme as Kate was proposed, you know, sort of putting forward. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, if you want, if you want to mute yourself, I'll, I'll bring Nancy back and then we've got three or four other people um, as well that want to come in. I'm not, everyone seems quite happy to chat here. So I'm not, I'm not stopping the recording at this point because I think the punters that then come to watch this will want to hear people who have got a similar concern to themselves. So, um, Nancy. Right, well, um, you know, I, I think that one of the things that we have lost um, over the last 30 years is the real distinction between adults and children. Uh, and part of the you know, whole problem here is that we are trying to use children to solve adult problems. So, you know, maybe you think that, you know, stigma against gay people is a problem. And so you want to use that, you want to indoctrinate children so that that's not a problem anymore. And, but I think that, um, I, I think that it doesn't hurt to just assert that children are different from adults um, and that uh, we aren't doing them any favors by exposing them to things before they are ready to handle them, you know, and that actually comes from the 70s where, uh, you know, you had people trying to raise their kids in the middle of the sexual revolution and they just gave up, basically. They said, we can't protect our children anymore. You know, they, there's too much around. So all we can do is prepare them. And so that was kind of uh, preparing kids became kind of just throwing up your hands and saying, well, they're going to encounter this anyway. So I'll just try and be there for them. Um, but I think that I think that um, that there's a certain reality about what can ki kids can handle and what they can't. That even people who disagree with you um, will uh, will recognize. And I think, you know, it. it we should just remind people that, you know, these are children and our understanding of things is not their understanding of things. They're very impressionable. And so with the transgender stuff, you know, when you, when you, you know, when you sit down with a kindergartner and you say you can be a boy or a girl or, or neither, you are influencing them. You are introducing something to them that is deeply destabilizing for them. Because for you know, for little kids, knowing that you're a boy or a girl, no matter you know how you end up as an adult, that is your anchor. That is a very important thing about how you begin to find your way in the world. Um, and so, you know, we should be, you know, we should not be undermining that. And uh, and then in terms of like the whole sort of social contagion with tr teenage girls and trans. Um, I, I get the feeling from talking to teachers that there are a lot of them who recognize that, say, giving into pronouns or, you know, or uh, agreeing to change a name, that is not a neutral act. That is actually a psychological intervention. And that is something that that teachers are not qualified to do and by and large don't want to do. Um, and so I think I think in some ways teachers are looking for someone to almost give them permission to say, no, we don't want politics. We don't want ideology and education. We just want to educate kids on the subjects that we teach um, and leave, you know, leave all of that up to kids and their families. Um, and. You know, I mean, I know, I know it's it's difficult because there's a certain subset of people who uh, very much disagree with that. But I can't believe that there isn't a silent majority of of teachers um, who uh, who who don't want to be part of that. And I also think it's one thing that we haven't been very successful um, with here in the states, but you might have better luck at it, is getting parents and teachers to work together. Because I think that's that's incredibly important because what happens now is that there tends to be, I mean, there has been for a while, but the parents are kind of seen as a problem for the teachers. But actually, we should be allies because, you know, we have, you know, we we are uh, trying to bring our kids into the world. Um, and so if you can find a way for teachers, you know, in the open or secretly or whatever to be able to 
um, to let you know what's going on, to come up with ways to uh, combat, you know, to combat good things. I think that would be a step in the right direction. Great. Thanks. I mean, one of the things I, I'm going to chip abuse the chair. Um, <clears throat> someone just posted. I think there's a divide, parent teacher divide. I think there's some truth to that, but we actually, interestingly, uh, we're getting increasing number of emails from teachers. Um, so next Monday, for example, I'm going to meet someone um, who works in a Catholic school in Dundee. It was just absolutely appalled by what's happening and you get, we're getting a number of teachers uh, picking up on this and I, I think my approach I mean I can appreciate Claire's anger and I'm just glad my children are not in school now um, because I'd feel like picking up a baseball bat with some of these issues I have to say um, but I don't think they're paedophiles and I don't think it's grooming even though you might get the odd one um, I think there's something else there's something more profound and more difficult about the nature of culture at the minute, which we've got to try and work out. Uh, and just to just to say, and this is, I'm, for example, I'm pro-gay rights, um, as, 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 as I think most people are. I'm pretty liberal when it comes to um, sex, whatever that means. Um, I historically was an anti-racist. I'm also an atheist. But at the same time, I can appreciate the religious teachers, the religious parents who have often reacted to what's happening. And I think what we're trying to do is create a kind of connection between all these people. Because um, I think you can have all sorts of outlooks and views, but still think what's happening here is absolutely appalling uh, and a real problem, not just for education, but for kids. I mean, I think kids genuinely, I think there's a real problem with the transgender issue that the number of kids that are being potentially damaged by this is uh, astonishing. Uh, Simon. Can you hear me? Yeah, 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 I'm on. Right. So no, I just wanted to ask a kind of a, a more holistic question, I suppose, that links to what Kate was talking about. Um, I'm on the Sioux board, but my background has been in social work and community work where we do an awful lot of co-production, um, but we're working with adults in community work. And that, that kind of that uh, uh, loss of distinction between children and adults that you spoke about does kind of ring true with me. But this week, last week, I was doing a presentation to some education academics. And um, I mean, I was at work, so I had to kind of watch what I was saying. But I, I just want to know how honest do you think they are or how dishonest do you think they are? Because they're certainly trying to deliver a, a, an agenda. They have something they're trying to push. Um, but at the, at the same time, it seems incredibly cynical uh, if if we just kind of believe that they are really surreptitiously trying to push an agenda. And, and, and what I was really kind of quite flabbergasted by was that they talked about, and this is with uh, preschool and early primary school children we were discussing, is they want to co-produce the curriculum with, with these children. And you think, well, that's interesting. Um, so, so what exactly are the children going to bring to that conversation then in terms of co-production of a curriculum? And that, and that brings you back to that end of division between uh, children, uh, children and adults. But um, for me, it, it seemed that whilst they're quite, they seemed sincere in their discussion and their, their belief that co-production co of curriculum was the way forward for, to enhance learning. There's certain areas that they wouldn't be happy with you co-producing. So if, if the children started saying, well, in actual fact, we think boys are boys and girls are girls, then that, then that kind of stuff wouldn't be allowed. It would be challenged. So they, they so for me, it, it, I get confused about how cynical they are, how honest or dishonest they are being and how well-meaning they are. Because, I mean, I think a lot of them do want the best for kids and they really believe that's what they're doing. Yeah. Uh, Jenny? Um, gosh, I, I think I just want to make two points. One um, about the general problem we face in terms of, as people have highlighted, this problem of being or feeling that we are absolutely powerless and parents feel this even more than people who say whose children have left school or, or, or who don't have children in the system. And 
I, th I think we have to we have to remember that that we're at a stage when we're, we're just starting to try and organize around this. Other people have also started to organize around this. And to remind you that it's not all doom and gloom. You know, you look at something like the Isle of Wight, right? There, a transvestite went into school, and of course, they're a small community, so it's only, you know, one school that you're dealing with but found out that this transvestite had been pushing a sex education um, class. She'd been holding it, introducing all sorts of completely inappropriate um, uh, things to a class which included seven to nine-year-olds. And the parents said that children were coming back completely traumatized by this. And they got the parents together and they got quite a significant group of parents together, went to the education authorities and kicked up a big stink about it, such that the Isle of Wight Education Department has withdrawn the sex education program for the time being. Now, here's the difficult part, right? That sex education program for the Isle of Wight was provided by the Scottish government. It hasn't been mentioned very much, but the Scottish government's curriculum for relationships, sex, and parenting has been now has been obviously rolled out, at least to some authorities. And there's the problem, right? Because in Scotland, this is official government policy, which runs right through the whole country, every single school, apart from, to some extent, private schools, which are insulated to some extent. Um, and their sex education thing is, is now... Absolutely. I wouldn't say it's embedded because teachers still can't teach it. So they have to bring in these third party people, you name it, transvestite, this group and that group. The other aspect of the problem is that the government is being advised by all these third party groups. They're completely integrated here and are providing this sort of stuff. Um, so it is a very, very big problem. And how do we actually fight it? Well, I think that we've got to organize the way that the Isle of Wight people do. And Claire made the point, right? Perhaps we do need a big group of people because one parent cannot fight this on their own. We do need, we need to be, try and be active about it as far as we can, particularly where we've got a parent who's sort of already in the process of protesting, but we're still very small, so we've got to admit that we can't do everything at the moment. But I think the second thing is what Stuart mentioned. I think we've got to get material into the hands of head teachers and teachers, and particularly make the point that what's happening, especially in relation to the trans issue, is highly dangerous for children. It's highly dangerous for children because their official policy is that children in Scottish schools should be socially transitioned. That means that teachers must unquestioningly accept it when a child comes to them and says, I am wanting to change my sex. I want to be a boy or I want to be a girl. And teachers are, in fact, encouraged not to question that, but to start using the pronouns and to start um, accepting the children in different clothes. And worse than that, encouraging the other children in the class to accept that situation too. And there's very good research to indicate 
that that kind of social transitioning is putting these children on the next step, which is to go through services that are going to encourage them to go onto puberty blockers, onto cross-sex hormones, and ultimately when they're approaching adulthood, surgery. So this is very, very dangerous, but we have to actually take that up politically. I think we have to take that up politically. We're trying to do that through the Substack, and I hope you know everyone will actually encourage people to really use that Substack because it is trying to give parents and teachers the arguments they need and hopefully we'll get a, a pamphlet into the hands of teachers and, and parents. Thanks, Jenny. I'll, br I'll bring Nancy in a second. Um, just to make the point, I got an email today from a, a parent whose seven-year-old child um, had been educated that they might be gender fluid and it came home upset because this is a girl, seven-year-old girl, who was worried because she liked dinosaurs. So she was worried she might be a boy. Um, and there's a kind of comical dimension to this, but it's absolutely horrific. And I do think this is going to be an issue that um, you can, we can, it can be successful because the, it's so destructive and so dangerous. When people think of the trans thing, I think they often think about these men, you know, like standing around being women, pretending to be women. But actually, the problem for me is the, it's kids and the kids who are being encouraged. They haven't got gender dysphoria. This has nothing to do with, you know, being liberal about live and let live. This is something profoundly different and really disturbing, I think. And um, I mean, one of the things that possibly can happen is that local councils, to a certain extent, have got a, 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 an element of control over a sex education curriculum. So that's one of the things we're hoping to do as well as do road shows around different parts of the country. So we're sorting one in Aberdeen and I've got a, a meeting organised in Dundee. And really want to see if you can try and create a, a body of people who can actually be activated to put pressure on the council to, to change it. And that's very interesting what you said, Jenny. I didn't realise that, that Isle of Man thing. So that's useful. Because if that was the Scottish curriculum and they've just binned it to a certain extent, then you can start to say, look what's happened. <laughs> Isle of Man, Isle of White. Um, so I think I think that's useful, and of course there's other groups. There's lots of groups that are already doing this. So I, I think M Maggie Mellon's here, and there's a, a, lots of feminists have already been making a, a huge stink about this at various levels, which have been incredibly useful. You've got this guy, the Glasgow cabbie on Facebook, who's been, you know, he, he's got a body of people around him to a certain extent. We've got the Scottish Family Party, which is there. So there is a potential for mobilising quite a few hundred people. Now, spontaneously, I kind of want to stand outside a school. But at the other hand, I realise that standing outside a school is kind of perhaps not the best tactic because there's kids and, you know, it's kind of, it, it, it's, it has a bad taste in its mouth. I'll bring you in a minute, Claire. We'll all come to your school. Anyway, Nancy. Right. Um, well, a couple of points. Um, I'm not sure... I'm not sure that I, uh, I, I agree with you, Stuart, about there not being pedo or you didn't say there weren't pedophiles, but I think we need to be realistic because what's happened is that with the blurring of the line between adult and children, um, you know, inappropriate beha behavior happens more often. So like in the Chicago school system, 80 teachers have been suspended for inappropriate sexual contact with kids. 80 teachers, eight zero, you know, you know, text or touching or, you know, it, and, and, and you just think, how can that be possible? And yet, I, and yet I think, you know, that it just is, is, we should be open minded about it because the erosion of that line between children and adults has really done some damage, I think. Um, so the, but the other thing I was going to say, um, well, two other things. One is that there's something that um, you know, probably anyone in the world can be doing over the next couple of weeks, which is March 12th is Detransition Awareness Day. Um, and there is an excellent film out, which you can screen. It's called Affirmation Generation. I will stick the link of it, the link up into the chat. 
Um, but you can um, invite people to watch that and to discuss it. And that is an, a really excellent film that just lays out um, it lays out, you know, what is going with the medicalization of uh, young gender questioning people. Um, and, you know, the, the other thing is, it's so ironic because uh, when you start to look into this, it seems that what is presenting, and what is, what is called gender dysphoria in kids is actually fear of sex. Um, you know, it's fear of being a man or fear of being a woman or fear of intimacy um, because they have been exposed to sexual content before they were ready for it. And it scared the crap out of them. Um, and so, you know, so that's, you know, that that is, uh, you know, that that's something that we that 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 we should uh, that we should uh, sh should bear in mind. Oh, everybody's muted. Stuart, you're muted. Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> I, I hate it when people do that and then I do it, of course, it's a bit buffoonery. Uh, right, I was just saying, I've got three people before I bring Claire back in and then I'm going to stop the recording, just in case there's anybody else that wants to uh, uh, chip in. Um, Alex. Hi, oh, Hi, hello, um, I'm an old daddy. Just so you know, I've got eight-year-old twins and a 10-year-old, um, and I'm a child of the 70s. Um, and it always kind of amazes me when I look at how my wains are being brought up and the kind of things they're doing and saying and all that kind of stuff. When I contrast that to what I was doing at their age, it horrifies me what I got away with, the kind of things I was doing. Um, and so you kind of... And I raise this only because you kind of see that... Actually, in terms of raising children, there has been a lot of progress and good things have happened through the last few decades. Rather bring up my wains now in Madrid, by the way, than bring them up in Glasgow in the 70s, I can assure you. But nevertheless, Nancy um, um, brought this up. In terms of this idea as what is to be done, I think the 70s provides a wee kind of key for us in the sense that it was not only divorce, that skyrocketed um, in the 70s. It was also economic crisis that absolutely ruptured everybody's life and deindustrialization, which was really important in particular um, in, in Glasgow and other parts of Scotland. Um, I remember when I was a wee boy, just about everything we'd done socially and privately was kind of organized through my dad's work. He worked in the shipyards. We went to parties at Christmas that was thousands and thousands of wains that was organised by the shipyard. Um, my dad drank his life in a social club that was organised through the shipyard. Um, just about every part of your life, you could see that it was moulded um, by um, that idea of people being in the one place at the one time and sharing values. And um, so that kind of community, I think we kind of forget what community actually meant in particular in the past. It's where we got our ideas. It's where we got our values. Fast forward to the noughties and onwards. And understandably, people like Claire are kind of going, what do we do? Because we're a fragmented um, um, bunch of people now. We don't have the same places where we can go to raise complaint and get support um, and all the rest of it. And I think that, um, you know, gives us an indication of what we might do today. I'm not suggesting we don't approach our MPs. I'm not suggesting we don't approach um, community organisations. But I kind of do suggest it's probably no really going to be that fruitful. Um, so for me, as Jenny has pointed out, you know, for the want of a better word, people power. We need to have new networks of people behind us um, so that we can mount some kind of challenge. Because I don't see the fruit coming um, to contacting schools directly as an individual, nor MPs, nor um, 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 community councils and, and all the rest of it. So I think the first port of call has to be building a new network of people who are worried about this stuff. 
um, and then taking that on to the next um, step. All right, thanks, Alex. Uh, Penny. I, I think that's I think that's right. I mean, we we've heard from quite a lot of parents who've said that they're going through the complaints procedure, and when I when I think about the school that my kids went through, I was on the parents' council, and I used to see the other side of the complaints procedure because sometimes the head teacher would share it with you, and in his case, there was just utter contempt. For parents, complete and utter contempt from parents. In fact, it really struck me that he was like a shop owner um, meeting people who'd complained about the product. In other words, it was like a consumer relation, consumer and producer relationship. And I, I think that that's a very lonely relationship. You're just sending the product back. Talking to Malcolm Clark for this week's Substack, he kept on saying, we need to tell them to stop. And then we had a discussion, well, what should we ask them to stop? And I think that we could make some very clear demands. We could say stop importing classes from outside organisations until we've had a public discussion about what we want to say about these issues. So that could be one demand. We could say stop sexual stereotypes, no more sexual stereotypes, stop telling our kids that if they feel or behave one way in primary school, that they might, then we've got to then subject to some, some kind of gender. We could say, <laughs> stop saying born in the wrong body. We could just have stickers that we gave out as a part of a national came saying, not age appropriate. And we, and we just try and put them wherever we think there's an opportunity. I don't know how that would work, but maybe we can just put it in relation to schools or we could do it online. Um, but I think we do need to create the framework through which parents don't feel that they're individual consumers um, doing these things. And I think we also need to say to teachers, if you don't think you're equipped to teach something, then you shouldn't let it be taught in your classroom. Because although we often say, oh, teachers aren't, you know, teachers aren't able to teach these issues. I think at secondary school, if you think it's important, then you should teach it. If you think the gender issues, and I think at the moment you do have to have discussions about the gender debate in secondary school. It's completely inappropriate, age inappropriate in primary, but you have to have it in secondary school. And in that situation, then I think you urgently need to discuss with staff and the parent council what it is you're, you're saying to the kids. But I think we could start to have a campaign which is stop not age appropriate and we kind of start putting our mark and our judgment on some of these things so parents aren't fighting the thing individually. Great, thanks for that. Um, right, I've got Linda and I'll come back to Claire and then I'll stop the recording in case there's any, any, anything else there. Uh, Linda? Uh, yeah, it, it's just following up on what, what Penny said there and earlier what Nancy said that the teachers that I come across, the, not the teachers, sorry, the parents that I come across, they kind of uh, lack the confidence to, they seem to lack the confidence to uh, challenge teachers. Um, and I think a lot of that is because of what Nancy said that, you know, experts have really taken over what was used to be common sense and, and uh, you know, teachers and, and parents together. Uh, socialising and educating kids you know and I used to come back from school and say I've been belted by the teacher my mum used to say well you probably deserved it um, whereas that might not be the case now so you know there is this this confidence uh, issue that a lot of parents have and the, this week um, the sub stack that we put out had a really useful article in it by um, Kieran Kelly who really explained that actually, in, even though in Scotland government policy is to push all this, um, you know, identitarian uh, education out to schools, um, the 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 responsibility for educating children still lies with parents, and it is there, and they delegate that responsibility to schools. And therefore, parents have the absolute right to go in and ask about what is being taught to their children. And they should feel absolutely, you know, uh, strong in doing that because, you know, in essence, the, the, the Equality Act and the law in Scotland is behind them. Um, and they should not, they're being, 
you know, they're bigots or or anything like that, or they're going to be ostracised. They may well be, you know, they may may well not be treated well by the school, but they have an absolute right to do this, and I think that they they should uh, keep doing it and and raise these issues um, with with, um, with their their local schools, and you know, I think that these campaigns to say stop the, the you know stop you know teaching uh, age inappropriate kids these things will help that will help galvanize parents together to feel that they've got the confidence to go and do that so I think that you know whenever I see parents now who feel a bit taken aback by all this stuff and, and really worried and shocked by it I just point out to them they have an absolute right to go in and, and do something about it if they want to. Right. Okay, I'll bring Claire and then I'll come back to Nancy for a sort of initial final say. I, I can see we've got Joseph, but I'll stop the recording after Nancy spoke and I'll come to Joseph and then if anyone else wants to say anything unrecorded, Claire. Hi there, thanks for giving me another chance to speak. Um, first of all, Linda Murdoch, if it hadn't have been for you and me hearing you speak that day in Glasgow, I would not be here. So thank you very much, Linda. And also when we were outside Holyrood the week after outside Parliament, I got one of the Scottish Union for Education's cards. Linda, you were amazing that day and you were. that's why I'm here. You're the reason and I've told everybody about you. Um, I just want to say what, what Alex was saying earlier about the way you were brought up in the 70s. I was late 70s. I'm going to be 45 this year. I'm from a working class background. My father was a PTI at Glen Oakle Prison. My mother never worked. She wasn't allowed to until I got, got to high school. And all my social growing up when I was wee was all social aspects. Bairns all running about everywhere in each other's houses. Different times now. Really scary times now, Alex. So I, I get that. <laughs> Um, I've, I've told my kids not to buy into the, uh, if there's any they or thems or, can you walk, I do not anymore, here, sorry, <laughs> um, I've told my kids that if there's any theys or thems or he's that are confused or she's that are confused, they've not to buy into it um, and they've to keep on with using the, the correct, it's a he, it's a penis, it's a she, vagina. Um, a friend of mine um, who is part of the Fourth Valley Feminists as well, um, she's a farmer and I'll never ever forget what she said to me 18 months ago when I first started kind of getting into this. She says, if I was to cut the balls off one of my bulls, it would become a bullock. Under no fucking circumstances would it become a cow, right? <laughs> so that tells me, that's, that's basic, right? It's basic biology. She met somebody that she was at uni at one of these matches and her daughter's 23, thought she was trans and she went in at the early menopause at 23 years old. And that girl has significant mental health problems because she get fucking three quarters of, sorry, she got three quarters of the way through it and realized, wait a minute, I'm a woman. I'm not a man after all because the human brain, I'm a, my, my living, I'm a cannabis consultant. I deal with a lot of people with cancer, fibromyalgia, all of those things. Uh, and the human brain, we know that doesn't stop developing until it's 21 years old. And we cannot, a, a, a child between the age of seven to nine, does they know if it wants a Burger King or a McDonald's? Why are, they, why are children getting asked? The only thing a penis and a that name should be for at that age is for peeing out of. Nothing else, nothing else. We don't want drag queens in telling them stories. We don't want somebody saying, to them, if they're gay, they're gay, embrace their sexuality. They're no trans, they're gay, or they're confused. Don't give them puberty blockers. This is my whole thing. And I think um, that, oh, the last lady was at Penny. She said, it's maybe not, we need to actively do something. I've, I've written to everybody about Santa Claus, and I'm still getting uh, ignored and immensely. And I just, I'm just bloody desperate. I'm just, I'm scunner. Do you remember Jean Fay Aberdeen, Linda? Do you remember Jean Fay Aberdeen talking in Glasgow? I'm scunner. That, that's what she said. And it's not just about, it's not just about them in later life. It's about putting into them at four years old, the confusion. Bairns have got enough to deal with these days. 
without the doubt in their mind of what they are, of who they are, of the very essence of who they are, is, is playing with fire. I believe it does go back to grooming. It's indoctrinating children. It's giving them a set of ideologies that are hiding to their parents. I've wrote it in the chat what the definition of grooming is somewhere. It's back there. And I believe it is. I really do. Thank you for the chance to talk. No, thanks. Thank Fantastic. I, I, it gives me another thought is that it's a thing. I, the, the work I did with a named person, um, the Christian Institute were involved. They're very smart, very professional, very tolerant. As I say, I'm, I'm not religious myself. Um, but very good. And what, one of the things they did was this really professional video where they went round and talked to these various parents about their worries about the named person. And I'm just thinking of we, 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 we're probably building up enough people now in terms of parents and teachers to potentially make videos where you get a professor come out of your house, just say, say what you think. And then you just you go mental like you just have done. I can go mental any day of the week about <laughs> yeah. this. Any day. So, so, so can I. <laughs> Um, but we could do that potentially um, and get a professional video and put it on YouTube and try and get, uh, you know, and, and I, I feel your pain because um, uh, uh, there's a lot of frustration. But as I say, I, I do think we have a chance to do something about this. Anyway, uh, Nancy. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I think um, it's that in terms of you know things that that can be done um i think part of the problem is that uh is that kids have an instinct uh, a lot of the time that this just is, doesn't feel right but they don't know what to say so during the pandemic when george floyd was uh was killed um my son was in the next room and he came in and he said mom i have to write about my privilege and i was like what and it's like, it's happening here. And so I mean, I'm downloading articles about the, you know, and, but he came up with something really good, he and his friends, which is that they went back and they said, you know, you call, you call this privilege. This is what every person should have. It's not a privilege. Um, and there was nothing that the teachers could really say about that. Um, uh, and I, and I think that there are, there are opportunities perhaps to you know, go through these arguments because I think people are hungry for good ways to respond to these things, and we're going to be much more effective if we can do that collectively. Um, the other thing I wondered about is um, is uh, there? Uh, I'm involved with an organization over here called the Foundation Against Intolerance and Racism, Fair, um, and we have a thing called Fair Transparency, where people can anonymously uh, report something going on um, in their workplace or in their school, um, and they can uh, work with someone. You can hook them up with a lawyer or give them advice. Um, so that might be, it might be worth seeing if it would be possible to uh, to set something up like that. I know that I put Amanda on to um, uh, the Terra Firma Teachers Alliance which is an organization that brings teachers together to subvert woke. Um, so they're all anonymous, um, but there are ways in your classroom that if you don't agree with this, uh, you can, you can, in, you can uh, make it known in a subtle way so that you don't risk your job. But you can also kind of, because kids are smart, kids will know that you, know, you, are, you are somebody um, who uh, doesn't agree with this stuff. Um, so those are those are some creative things um, that um, that have have come down the line over here, and I think could be effective over there. Um, and yeah, I was going to say something about dra drag queens, but I think I'll I'll, I'll <laughs> maybe do that later. <laughs> okay, thanks, Nancy. As I say, this is in theory we're we're not really stopping the meeting, but. Um, I'm going to stop the recording now, but before I do, for anyone that's watching this after the event, do get in touch. Info at scottishunionforeducation.co.uk. We need to build this so that in two years, three years' time, there's 500 people, 800 people in this meeting. And if we get that, then anything is possible, I suspect. Stop recording. There you go. Boom. Stop.